Saturday morning, the Experts Program continues, and we kick it off with Luis Alvarez, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group. Good morning, Luis. Good morning, Mark. How are you today? Doing pretty good. Is it a boating weekend for you? It will be, yeah. Not a uh, racing weekend, but the weather holds. I'm going to be heading out with uh, a couple friends and just kind of cruising around on the water. Sounds like fun. Yeah. We'll, we'll look for you guys out there on Sunday while I'm running the 49er game. <laughs> oh, excellent. <laughs> In fact, if you take a radio with you, you can listen to the game because I know we have a we have a big fat signal out over the bay. Well, I plan to because the Niners are playing my Dolphins. That's so right, they uh, are. So it's a game I have some interest in. By the way, you know, with the physics of AM radio, because of the way AM radio waves follow the curvature of the Earth, and that means that they have to use phasing of the voltage to send the signal to places where it can go and, and avoid places where they might interfere with stations on either the same frequency or adjacent. So what happens in California, and particularly in coastal California, the way you get a, a facility licensed is you can show the FCC that you're not going to interfere with other stations, and you do that by pumping the majority of your signal out over the Pacific Ocean. Oh, that's interesting. So yeah, so you could probably drive in your boat 100 miles northwest from the Monterey Harbor and pick us up just fine. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, saltwater AM signals really conduct saltwater super well. So once the signal hits that saltwater, it just multiplies it, and it just goes and goes and goes. So a little old tech talk for you. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fun facts. I love them. So the U.S. Treasury Department says some ransomware payments may need its express approval. We touched on this last week. What's the latest on this, Lewis? Cybersecurity Awareness Month, right? And, mm-hmm. the, and the hits just keep on coming. And October 1st, the U.S. Treasury passed some guidance that is going to really complicate life for people that are hit by ransomware. In essence, what the Treasury is saying is that when people pay ransomware, they're actually giving money to, to certain sanctioned individuals. These are folks that the federal government has identified as bad for national security. In in some cases, they're entire countries like North Korea or Iran. And in others, they're individual outfits that are out there trying to get money for nefarious purposes. So what they're saying is if you get hit by ransomware and you are forced to pay the ransom because you didn't take the proper steps to be able to recover from that, then before you can do that, you need to contact the U.S. Treasury Department to get permission because if you do it without their permission and it turns out that you have paid money to these folks, then they can come back at you and uh, your company, anybody that helped you, including somebody like us, for example, that might be helping a, one of our customers try to navigate that if for criminal or civil penalties. So it's become a real serious thing. And chances are that if you do pay ransomware, insurance companies aren't going to reimburse you until they get clearance from the treasury that that this was not a sanctioned entity. And if those people that wonder, well, how can they tell that happened? Well, most of these transactions take place using Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And one of the things about Bitcoin is it's a blockchain system, which means that you can track every transaction. It's available to anybody. It's not just, it's not like a bank account where you don't know uh, how much money is in the the account. Bitcoins use these public wallets that are assigned to people. So our intelligence people know exactly how much money these guys are collecting and who they're getting it from. So it makes it very easy for them to track. And if they find a transaction that originated in the United States or from some entity that's uh, governed by the U.S. government, then they're going to try to sit down and figure out why that happened. Now, the other downside for the business that gets hit with the ransomware is our network is down, our people can't work, they've put us out of business, and you're telling me I can't pay these people, and if I do, I could go to jail. So this puts the quote-unquote end user in a really tough spot. They're really between a rock and a hard place. This is where we have really worked to develop tools that allow our clients to recover from these things Mm -hmm. because there's no guarantee that that you can protect somebody from these attacks. Even the the federal government gets hit every now and then and they have resources that none of us can really ever hope to have. So what you need to do is you need to have a system in place that can detect these attacks early on so that you can stop them in their tracks. In worst case, be able to recover with good backups that are designed to resist ransomware because one of the things that the bad guys do now is once they infect your network, they look for your backup and they encrypt the backup as well mm. because they know that if you have a, uh, a system that backs up your files, they need to get to that too or else they won't get their money. Good advice from Luis Alvarez, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group. Luis, before we go here, uh, some cable TV talk. So you and I talked the other day about streaming from your mm-hmm. cable TV provider. So I was at the Comcast store the other day returning an old remote control to get a new remote control that works with a flat screen TV. And the salesperson mentioned to me, well, you know, you should be able, you know, you don't even have to have these remote controls. As long as you have
have one set top box in your house, you should be able to stream on your streaming TV all of the channels that you get from being plugged into that cable on the wall. And I thought, oh, that's great, man. That means one less remote control setup. I brought the remote control home with me just to be safe and spent the next few hours trying to get this thing to work. And it would not work. I kept getting an error message. Well, after calling technical support at Comcast, I finally got someone who knew how to ask the right questions. And what I found out was I have to change my tier of service to a different type of Comcast service or Xfinity service in order to have the streaming capability. If you just have the regular cable, the plug coming out of the wall, that's not going to work. It'll never work. At least at this point, it won't work. And so they're basically trying to upsell you to a different level of service. So at that point, I said, thank you very much. And I hooked up the new remote control and lesson learned. But what it got me thinking about was, okay, these guys are really suffering from cord cutting. They are losing hundreds of thousands of customers every year. They have all of this cost tied up in this expensive infrastructure, right? They've got cables running off of telephone poles all over the country. It costs a lot of money to maintain that infrastructure. At what point do the people in Philadelphia that run Xfinity say, we have to transition the entire network to a streaming platform in order to stay in business because we can't continue to carry this huge cost that our competitors aren't saddled with. So I think that at some point down the line, they're going to have to give over. Economics is just going to dictate to them. They cannot afford to maintain the wired network that they have, and they're going to have to go wireless. What do you say? I agree with you. And don't be surprised if when that happens, you have a situation that you have today with AT&T, where the government actually pays them to maintain these old POTS lines in rural areas that don't make AT&T any money. And if it was left up to them, they'd shut that all down. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the same thing with the cable company. At some point when Comcast says, and we're done, the government will step in and say, no, we'll subsidize you to keep that cable plant in place because not everybody wants to move to wireless yet. Right. So it's going to be a really interesting dynamic, but I agree with you. It's, it's inevitable. They see it. They're just trying to push back the tide of the future as long as they can. And the other thing that's going to come out of this, at a certain point, once they start to make the transition from a wired system to a wireless system, they're going to go back to the cities that they pay franchise fees and say, look, why should we be paying you a franchise fee? Mm-hmm. Sling doesn't pay you a franchise fee. HBO doesn't pay you a franchise fee. Why should we? And secondly, why should we pay to have all these community channels on that nobody watches? That's all bandwidth. That's a waste. So yeah. we're going to become more like Sling. See you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, what's, exactly. and what's to stop them from doing that? Once they start delivering their service over the internet, what's to stop them from going to the city of Monterey and saying, hey, you know, Amp, you're out of here. Monterey Channel, goodbye. All that kind of stuff. And then those channels also have to transition into YouTube or some other streaming service that hmm. those people that want to watch can, but uh, doesn't take that whole infrastructure that we currently use to support those public access channels. Yeah, we live in fascinating times, don't we? <laughs> we do. We do. <laughs> All right. Luis Alvarez has been our guest, CEO of the Alvarez Technology Group. Online, AlvarezTG.com, at AlvarezTG, the Twitter handle, and Luis, the toll-free number for the iTeam. Give us a call at 866-78-ITEAM. That's 866-784-8326.